my humanity is caught up and inextricably bound up in yours. I feel human because I belong. It speaks about wholeness. It speaks about compassion. Those aware of their interconnectedness with others have a proper self-assurance that comes from knowing that they belong in a greater whole. This is a quote from uh, a uh, Nobel Prize winner um, and South African um, spiritual leader, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. He speaks of belonging as a, of a basic human need, which awakes in us with our first breath. By defining to what kind of family, community, or culture we do or do not belong, we define who we are. Just to give you a very uh, simple example. When I was in secondary school, one of my teachers once gave us a task. Write down 10 of the nouns that best describe you in the order of priority. On our completion of the task, the teacher told us that these were the definition of ourselves as we saw them. So I wrote, a human being, a girl, a schoolgirl, a daughter. I don't remember the rest of the nouns, honestly. But the ones I do remember show that I define myself by my relationship to others. By those who were my family, those who had the same gender, those who had the same occupation, those who were of the same species. We cannot talk about ourselves in any different way. And talk, in this case, is the operative word, because we only need to talk about ourselves when somebody asks us for it. That somebody may be my secondary school teacher, that may be very well we ourselves. But the point is, we cannot figure out who we are until we do not start talking about it. Explaining ourselves is our only means to give sense to our lives and confirm it with others. And yes, we do need that confirmation because that confirmation is a confirmation of us belonging, of us being human. If nobody buys our story about ourselves, what are we worth? The worth of stories for humanity has been discussed since the beginning of the times. I will sum it up in the words of a German linguist and philosopher, Wolfgang Eiser. In his book, The Fictive and the Imaginative, he writes, a, a human being can only perceive reality as a variety of discourses. What Professor Eiser means here is that our reality is not an absolute. Each of us constructs his or her own reality from the stories that we hear or read about it. These stories can vary. When we are very little kids, these are um, the fairy tales that our parents tell us before we go to bed. When we grow a little older, uh, these are um, textbooks that we read at school. When we grow up, they may be patterns of perception, social systems, our entire worldview. The better we articulate our understanding of reality, the more convincing, mature, and respectful human beings we seem to other. So storytelling, or telling stories about our reality, had greatest power and still have over the human imagination, mind, and morale. Accordingly, storytellers have always been at the center of the social order. In Greece, in ancient Greece, Philosophers were uh, the most respected and influential people of the polis. In tribal societies, the wise man, the medicine man, uh, the elderly uh, were the ultimate instance of decision-making. Nowadays, good oratorical skills is an inseparable part of a good leader's qualities. So when I give it a thought, storytelling is a profession. Because if you're good at it, if you develop your skill, you can make a living out of it. Um, so I cannot see why storytelling as a skill cannot be passed on from one generation to another. 
And when it is passed on from one generation to another, it becomes a tradition. The tradition of storytelling has always been instrumental for the definition of a national identity. Just think of it. When you think France, you already see the great tradition of the French novels and the French movies. When you think the great Russian soul, the concept originated from the works of the Russian writers of the 19th century. The United States of America walked an extra mile. They capitalized on their tradition of storytelling. American television shows and films is the second largest export of the country. So all cultures who have a distinct tradition of storytelling usually have a very strongly defined national identity, which entails the feeling of national pride and self-confidence. But at the same time, these cultures have a very well-working mechanism of sustaining and updating their tradition of storytelling. In Western European cultures, it usually is a mentoring system where the storytelling skills are passed from one writer to another. Uh, the Northern America, on the other hand, is well known for its schools of creative writing. Um, NYU, Columbia University, UCSC, you name them. But in Lithuania, for some reason, writing is seen as a very individual practice, a pure vocation. And calling writer a profession very often even seems somehow degrading to the occupation. I have a, a hypothesis to why that is so. And I personally link this cultural trend to institutionalization of storytelling. What does that mean? The national tradition of storytelling has always had a very direct and close relationship to powers of structure. Um, it is not for nothing that the Soviet Union forbade the spread of the authentic Lithuanian folk culture at the Soviet Lithuania, that they censored all the movies, novels, plays, and television shows that were made in Lithuania. Controlling the stories that circulate in an oppressed nation is a common practice of the oppressor. And this practice gave birth to the renowned school of Lithuanian metaphorical theater, uh, the great Lithuanian poetry, the so-called Lithuanian poetic film. Because heavily censored writers had to look for indirect ways to communicate their messages. Codes and symbols became their weapon against censorship. There's a very well-known um, American folk trio called Peter, Paul, and Mary, and have the, they have a very witty and sharp song in which they describe this kind of situation in a funny and, I think, accurate way. The song goes, I think I could say something, if you know what I mean. But if I really say it, the radio won't play it unless I lay it in between the lines. This kind of attitude produced some powerful literary and cinematic work in Lithuania. However, this kind of encoded storytelling has never been institutionalized. We all know that Lithuanian history is marked by a, an almost a broken series of annexations. So all Lithuanian writers who wanted to get professional training had to seek for it in the lands of the oppressor. Such trained writers, consequently, were treated with very huge suspicion by the Lithuanian people. Yes, they had the skill and the experience. They might even have had the talent, but did they really have loyalty and the sincerity? Could they really be trusted with communicating the, the true condition of their people? According to the common belief, probably not. So Lithuania has become a country of self-taught writers who come from the common people and express their true self in codes and detours that are supposed to come from the heart, naturally, and that are supposed to be guarded watchfully and not to be distributed to just anyone. I think this kind of tendency or trend is still very much prevalent in our culture nowadays. And I draw such a conclusion from my own experience, because I hire people who want to write for a living. I have got my degree in screenwriting at uh, the United States of America. So I was taught to express my thoughts and ideas as clearly as possible, always looking for the most accurate means of expression. I was taught that grammar matters, because if you don't have your grammar, no one will understand what you mean. And then this little scheme, which finally showed up behind me, 
we can see how the human mind perceives a meaning. If we get the top level of our triangle wrong, that is, if we use wrong inaccurate expressions, inaccurate grammatical structures, inaccurate tone, our reader or listener may never get to the point that we're making, which is at the bottom of the triangle. And I can give you a very simple example when one common may matter. So, if I say, I ate grandma, I put a comma before the word grandma. But if I don't use any comma, I turn into a cannibal who has just ate her grandma, right? I ate grandma. And this is only on the level of a sentence, but when you move to the level of novels, plays, screenplays, the matter of the expression or the means of expression becomes even more complex. So that's why there's a reason why novels, plays, screenplays are even written in different layouts or these so-called formats. I was taught that too. But most importantly, I was taught to respect and trust my audience. And this is what, in my experience, professional training gives you. It exposes you to the variety of the tools and possibilities that you have at your hand and shows you how the proper use of those possibilities can actually expand your options and help you disclose your full potential. And what, that is the big, biggest flaw that I see in the people who want to pursue a writer's career in Lithuania. They often do not know what, what their possibilities are. They may not discriminate between genres, formats, or registers of the language because they thought these are technicalities of which a true writer does not have to know. They often do not know how to articulate their ideas in a structured and argumentative manner. Moreover, and most importantly, they are not used to talking about their ideas. Another example from my own experience. Lately, I met a very young, talented lady who is about to do her PhD studies um, at a Lithuanian university. She came to me because she wants to write screenplays. She was very nervous, I could feel, at our first meeting. So I thought, you know what? I'll just start our conversation with something she feels totally comfortable about, just to loosen her up and to start us off on a friendly ground. So I asked her, what is your PhD thesis going to be about? And guess what? The question left her speechless. She could barely say a sentence about the work of her lifetime. I really doubt it was because she knew nothing about the sub subject. I am pretty sure it was because she was never taught or get accustomed to talking about it to anyone other than her academic supervisor. She was used to solitary work and he keeping her ideas to herself or to her immediate academic environment. And this is what I see as one of the biggest holes of our educational system. Students of all levels are not taught to articulate their ideas clearly and transparently, without fear of being judged or criticized, embracing the possibility of dialogue, actually appreciating the very possibility to share their ideas with somebody else. What that means to me, it means that they, not, they do not disclose their full potential. They don't have a possibility to discover it. And I am convinced it is a remnant of our recent history when speaking your mind clearly and unambiguously could get you into very serial tr serious trouble. Laying low and speaking in hints was a means of survival in the Soviet society, and it is still very much a part of our culture, upbringing, and self-perception. It has no doubt to change. It inevitably will change, because as an old Latin proverb says, times change, and we change with them. Now we live in very demanding times. As a country which was back on the world map quite recently, I mean 20 years, uh, is a very short time span in the world history. We have to redefine our identity to ourselves and to others. If we want to have a voice in the global dialogue, we have to redefine that identity clearly, assertively, and quickly. It is by no means easy. There are so many things that we're not allowed to discuss openly only some 20 years ago. Faith, sex, money, self-esteem, the worth of an individual for the society. Although no, the ban is broken, we still have not developed a language in which we can discuss these issues openly. 
without obliquities, comprehensively even to those who do not share our experiences. It is, not a, it is a very collective effort to develop such a language. To, to accomplish such a task, we cannot retreat into ourselves. We have to go the opposite direction. We have to share with and learn from one another. In other words, we need to develop a mythology of our times. If we do not do it, someone else will do it for us, rest assured. They're already doing it. Look at the American movies of foreign television shows. The image of Lithuanians who do nothing but commit ruthless crimes has already made its way into, into that discourse, and we cannot control it anymore, but we can overpower it with a different kind of stories that can be as captivating and convincing, that are bigger and live longer than newspaper articles or blog posts. Creating a story is a strenuous and time-consuming task. It requires not only an in-depth knowledge of the language in which you write the story, but also a very good knowledge of the human soul about which you write. This kind of knowledge can be gained just in the same way as any other kind of know-how, step by step. The best place to start is to look into yourself, figure out what you feel, think, and want, articulate it, and share it with others. Seems like a very simple task, but there is much more to it than meets the eye. Lately, I've accomplished uh, a documentary, which actually part of it was shot in this wonderful theater, because the documentary was about a very famous Lithuanian premier dancer who ended his life by committing a suicide. He hanged himself. And I was interviewing a lot of his friends and colleagues, and almost all of them said, oh, we wish we, could, we, we had known what was wrong so that we could have helped. But that was the problem. The man could not explain what exactly was wrong. He didn't have a language for that. He was not used to talking about these things. I'm pretty sure if he could rationalize his problem and talk about it, he could have helped himself. Renowned American mythologist Joseph Campbell once said, the influence of a vital person vitalizes. With the world without spirit is a wasteland, people have the notion of saving the world by shifting things around, changing the rules. No. No. Any world is a valid world if it's alive. The thing to do is to bring life to it, and the best way to do that is to find where in your own case life is and become alive. And this is what storytelling does. It helps us find life in ourselves. It has a great healing power. Uh, skillful storytellers are capable of capturing the nuances of our existence that we ourselves overlook in the course of our daily routines. Thanks to artful storytelling, our life suddenly starts making sense to us and to others. An ability to tell stories is inherent in every one of us, but it is only when it is developed, pursued, and shared that it unfolds in its full Power. So I believe that storytelling has to be included in every curriculum of our schools in the country because that is the best way to reinforce the vitality and the spiritual strength of our people. We often rem proudly remember our singing revolution which got us to the restoration of independence. But now, if we want to preserve and reinforce our independence, I believe we need a writing revolution. Welcome to TEDx Vilnius.